Greetings to you all and welcome this afternoon, this evening to our webinar, Becoming Political Actors, Strategies for Palestinian Liberation as we enter a Biden administration. My name is Michael Spath, the executive director of the host for today's webinar, the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Today's webinar is being recorded it will be posted on our Indiana Center for Middle East Peace YouTube channel and also be made available to our co-sponsors. They are the Israel Committee Against House Demolitions and ICAD USA and ICAD uh, UK, One Democratic State Campaign, Jewish Voice for Peace Action, Jewish Voice for Peace Detroit, the United Church of Christ Palestine Israel Network, the Israel Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church USA, Menno Pin Palestine Israel Network of the Mennonite Church USA, the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace in Washington, D.C., Kairos West Michigan, and the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. Moderating the webinar today is Robert Herbst. Bob is a human rights lawyer and a member of Jewish Voice for Peace. He has served as a special prosecutor for the International Criminal Tribunals for Sierra Leone and Rwanda. When he is not advocating for Palestinian rights, Bob's private practice since 1983 has focused on representing victims of police, corrections, and other government misconduct employment and housing discrimination on grounds of race, ethnicity, religion, gender, disability, and age, sexual harassment, and retaliation for whistleblowing. So Bob, it's a pleasure to have you moderate today. Take it away. Okay, it's been only four years since the UN Secretary <coughs> Security Council voted 14-0 with one abstention to condemn Israeli settlement building as a flagrant violation of international law and imperiling the viability of the two-state solution. Also condemned as illegal was Israel's confiscation of land, demolition of homes, and displacement of Palestinian civilians. Today, 2016 seems like a half century ago as the Trump administration's actions in the last four years collectively amounted to an unremitting assault on Palestinians and their national aspirations. Closing the Palestinian embassy in Washington, moving the US embassy to Jerusalem, recognizing Israeli sovereignty in the Golan Heights, cutting off aid to UNRWA and, and others. There's been little pushback from the global community as Israel's creeping annexation of Palestinian land has continued inexorably. And while formal annexation of 30% of the West Bank has been put off, normalization of the status quo by some of the Gulf Arab states has been secured by Israel instead. Today, as the Biden administration takes shape, the Palestinian struggle for civil and national rights seems to be at a low point. Palestinians appear to be isolated, divided, poorly served by corrupt and collaborationist leaders, lacking financial, political, and moral support. Their narrative as victims of Israeli and Western discrimination, colonization, and oppression still struggling to be heard, beset by high rates of unemployment, diminishing per capita income, and as if all that were not enough, now facing rising rates of pandemic infection. With the new administration in Washington burdened by other domestic and international issues, but hopefully shorn of the animus to Palestinians so characteristic of the last four years, the questions naturally arise. Where do Palestinians and their allies, of which I proudly count myself one, go from here in Palestine, in the diaspora, in Washington, Europe, and around the world? Are new strategies needed? What are they? Do we need a more overtly political program to accompany the grassroots protest? legislative lobbying, BDS, and other campaigns for Palestinian human rights? And if so, what would a more overtly political program look like? What would the end game be? If the two-state solution is dead, if it's no longer viable, is there or could there be sufficient Palestinian support for a one-state solution that guarantees equal rights, dignity, and resources to both peoples? How would we mobilize public opinion around it? 
there, here, and around the world? How do we get there? And how do we address the new administration in Congress in Washington? To help us answer those questions, we have assembled a most distinguished panel of Palestinian, Israeli, and American advocates. Awad Abdel Fattah is a Palestinian journalist living in the Galilee. He has been the Deputy Secretary General of the Ibn al-Balad Movement, Secretary General of the Balad Tajamo Party, and serves as the coordinator of the One Democratic State Campaign. Jeff Halper is an Israeli anthropologist, the director of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions, and a founding member of the One Democratic State Campaign. Among other books and articles, Jeff is the author of An Israeli in Palestine, War Amongst the People, and coming in January, Decolonizing Israel, Liberating Palestine, Zionism, Settler Colonialism, and the Case for One Democratic State. Huwaita Araf is a Palestinian American attorney and human rights advocate practicing law and organizing in Detroit, Michigan, where she was a 2020 Bernie Sanders delegate to the Democratic National Convention. Huwaita is a co-founder of the International Solidarity Movement, a Palestinian-led nonviolent direct action movement. She's also the former chair of the Free Gaza Movement, which in 2008 sailed the first two boats across the Mediterranean in defiance of Israel's blockade, illegal blockade on Gaza. And she was one of the organizers of the Gaza Freedom Frotilla and was sailing with it in 2010 when it was lethally attacked by the Israeli Navy. Beth Miller is the senior government affairs manager for Jewish Voice for Peace Action, where she leads the organization's congressional advocacy, legislative organizing and electoral organizing for human rights and equality for all Palestinians and Israelis. Beth has been an activist in the movement for Palestinian rights for a decade, including her time as US advocacy officer for Defense for Children International Palestine, where she co-led the nationwide No Way to Treat a Child campaign. So as our speakers address these questions, I'm gonna ask you to please put your questions in the chat and I'll try to get as many as I can uh, uh, answered as we go along. Awad, why don't you start us off? Thank you, and uh, hi everybody. Uh, indeed, the uh, the questions and the challenges that you post uh, are in fact being uh, debated uh, intensively by uh, Palestinian academics, uh, activists, uh, and uh, intellectuals. Uh, uh, every day and uh, almost every other day, at least myself engaged in a webinar about how can we get out of this political impasse. And uh, in fact, over the last 20 years, uh, there have been different or a variety, uh, or sorry, a diversity of initiatives and groups who are initiating a debate and not only that but even there are some groups are working uh, in the field uh, to challenge uh, the situation that has been imposed by the israeli colonial uh, regime and also uh, challenging the palestinian authorities policy uh, and uh, i to be honest uh, that uh, they are really uh, these initiatives or these individuals or academics or intellectuals or groups are really finding themselves in a very difficult situation, but they are not uh, desperate. Of course, they could be much of frustration, but they are they're thinking that we can get out of this impasse because we can't see only the bleak reality on the ground, but also we should see the bright spots uh, in this reality where uh, Palestinians continue to be active, steadfast on their homeland. Freedom fighters around the world are active and supporting the Palestinian issue. The BDS is making remarkable achievements. Uh, uh, the, the Palestinians themselves uh, numerically are equal to the Israelis, so they are in their homeland. But uh, we can't ignore the fact that after the Israeli regime, which is the main, the major obstacle before 
the liberation of Palestine, it's the Palestinian authorities' policies, which is really a major obstacle to be, be in front of uh, uh, creating an alternative option for the uh, Palestinian uh, Israel conflict. So, uh, and we can see uh, uh, also what is, is, is taking place uh, on the uh, level of the civil society organizations around the world. And we are encouraged by that uh, because Israel has really uh, failed to remove the Palestinian agenda from the international uh, uh, arena. And uh, the PDS, I can see, has uh, succeeded in reclaiming or restoring the solidarity campaign around the world because the, the international solidarity campaign with the Palestinian cause was really one of the victims of Oslo Accords uh, because uh, freedom fighters at the time, internationals, I mean, thought that the solution is, is close. And it, most of them maybe thought that there was no need to continue to struggle for the Palestinian uh, to, for, to engage in the Palestinian struggle. But, uh, uh, and that was one of the, one, as I had said, one of the uh, 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 catastrophic consequences of Oslo. That is, we lost our friends and states and individuals, and I mean, grassroots movements. So now I believe that we are restoring this uh, movement. I'm not saying that this is, I mean, going uh, easily, and uh, things are uh, close to or uh, have become uh, uh, victorious, but uh, we are, I think, uh, in, in the right path. So what is, is to be done now? First of all, we first, the, the, the priority is to reunite the Palestinian people. But since there is no uh, possibility uh, that the two major political factors on the Palestinian arena, Fatah, Fatah and Hamas, uh, are going to unite. Uh, we Palestinians who are active outside the traditional structures of the leadership think that we should network and build a large front, a broad coalition, so that we can and we uh, present a clear vision or an end game of our struggle that would attract the imagination of the world and connect with the freedom fighters. You know, the Palestinian uh, liberation movement once was part of the international liberation movement, were part of the progressive movement around the world. And as a result of Oslo, of course, we lost that. We, the, 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 the standing of the Palestinian national movement as part of the global progressive movement was lost. So now uh, we are uh, faced with this um, task that we should restore the, 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 the solidarity, so those, uh, movements and work together. Uh, and this is important because there is a growing awareness of uh, around the world among these global, I mean, these progressive movements that uh, of the intersectionality of the struggle, that all of us are struggling against one global system, which is new liberal system. And this new liberal system is the one that created in the 19th century, the Palestinian cause, the Palestinian problem, and many other problems around the world. And this system is still aggressive, still powerful, and uh, again, the progressive people are coming together uh, in, 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 in common awareness that we should uh, work together and build uh, a global uh, movement to fight this system. Of course, on the local level, each movement will have to do its best in order to uh, create the, the, the agent of a change, the effective player so that we can effect a real change in our local Arena. And at the same time, as I said, we should connect with each other and cooperate and, and run a cooperation better than any time before, because it's now time to do this.
Uh, just yesterday, I took part in a webinar about the role of the Palestinians inside the Green Line uh, in the Palestinian National Project. And I talked about uh, the uh, uh, One Democratic State campaign because I and other, and, uh, and along my, my colleagues, Palestinians and Jews, uh, believe that this is the only option this is the only uh, political uh, program that can really attract, unite, and mobilize the Palestinian people, as well as all those who believe in justice and equality around the world. This is what uh, we are inspired by the uh, South African experience, and we draw really hope and momentum in our struggle for justice. So this is in short, I mean, what we believe and our uh, political campaign, uh, our, our One Democratic State campaign, uh, which uh, was launched in uh, 2018, uh, is gaining uh, a relative uh, uh, momentum. Uh, and uh, recently we succeeded to integrate other groups who, which uh, advocate the same uh, uh, goal uh, uh, and we are working together. I think that the reality on the ground is uh, moving and changing in, 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 in that direction. And it is only a matter of time when more and more people will embrace this vision. I think that it is a waste of time for those who are still undecisive about that to continue to think that this is not the time to specify solutions because within the Palestinian, a critical force, there are those who think that it is not the time to talk about solution. The only uh, option they think that we should just reunite the Palestinian people, uh, restore the common narrative, uh, restore the unity of the Palestinian people, restore the idea of Palestine as one demographic unit, as one geographic unit. And then when we progress on when, uh, uh, at a certain point, when we think that we are approaching our goal, then we sit and talk about the one, the, the one democratic state solution. We believe that both national, uh, liber national liberation project and political project can to go together. I mean, uh, I, I, I call it national liberation uh, project that is uh, the one that unite the Palestinian people without specifying the solution. But we uh, have made a step, and I think this is the, uh, the largest step that has ever been made by Palestinians and Israelis uh, towards the one democratic solution, which we think that it is only a matter of time, as I said, when most people will accept that and we will have to work in that direction. I finished. <clears throat> Thank you, Awad. Jeff? <clears throat> All right, well, it's good to be with you all. Uh, a lot of you I know, uh, of course. And, um, and thanks to the panelists for agreeing to, to, to join. I'll just pick up really with where uh, Awad left off because we worked together in the One Democratic State campaign. Um, <clears throat> you know, for many years, since 1997, I've been the head of ICAD, the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions. Um, but ICAD has always been a political organization. Our idea has always been, how do we end this whole, you used to talk about occupation. Now I think we're talking about a larger issue. Um, so that house demolitions for us, that issue was a vehicle towards educating people, towards showing what Israel's intentions are, and really towards mobilizing people towards a political goal. Now in those days, still the days of Oslo, the political goal was fairly much agreed upon. That was the two-state solution. Uh, the international community had agreed on it. This was the Oslo program. Israel in principle had signed on to it. The, palace, the PLO accepted the two-state idea in 1988, if not actually before. And so we didn't really have to worry about what the end game was. That was the end game. And now we all had to work together to try to achieve it. Well, it became obvious uh, even at that time, but 
certainly afterwards and over the last 10 years, that the two-state solution is gone. It's not only is it dead, I'll come to this in a minute, but it never was. There was never ever uh, the possibility of a two-state solution. Israel would never entertain that for reasons I'll talk about in a minute. So in a sense, uh, over time, I would say, you know, over the last 10 years, that left us kind of floundering as an organization. You know, we're, we're, we're for Palestinian rights. Uh, we're very active. We have a campaign. We had funding. We had all, all, everything. But we, were, but we didn't have a political program. And I wasn't interested, to tell you the truth, in simply protesting. We could always build another house. I could always write another book. We could always do another demonstration. What's the point? Uh, and so to tell you the truth, I was on the verge of, of closing ICAD. And only the people in our group kind of kept me a little bit involved. Because I thought if we don't have an end game, if we don't have a political program that we're really attached to and, and advocating for, we're just spinning our wheels, basically. And what happened, as Awad said, about three, three and a half years ago, is that a number of us, uh, Palestinians, and primarily Palestinian citizens of Israel, and some Israeli Jews, got together and, uh, and founded the One Democratic State campaign. I think the idea is in the air, of course, one state, because it's almost a default if the two-state solution is, is, is over. Uh, but no one had ever thought it through, really. There are other one-state uh, organizations that we're working with, but everyone's come out with statements and not, not really. And I think what we've done, it took us a couple of years to do it all together. That's what Awad was referring to, is we really came up with a very detailed 10-point program. Um, in other words, uh, we analyzed the situation and we talk about how to decolonize and what our vision is of the future, which I think is a tremendous step forward. Uh, and I think one of the things that we've managed to do, because some of us are activists, some of us are academics and so on, is that we managed to bridge that, that, that gap. The problem today is that academics uh, writing about this issue are writing about it in, in a very powerful way. And the, 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 the great breakthrough has been this idea of settler colonialism, you know, because that's reframed the entire, the entire uh, situation. We always talked about a conflict, the Arab-Israeli conflict, the, Arab, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Well, that's a problem because conflict locks you into two sides and there really aren't two sides and there's no symmetry here. And the idea is you get out of a conflict through compromising. Well, there's no compromise when it comes to national rights or colonization or displacement. So that it, it was a non-starter kind of, a, it was a misanalysis that didn't get us anywhere, obviously, the two state idea, the idea of a conflict. Settler colonialism that's been very much developed within the academic world is a very powerful new way of conceiving of the situation that then opens up all kinds of possibilities for, res uh, to, for a resolution through decolonization. We'll talk about that later. The problem is that it's very academic. Settler colonialism hasn't really percolated out into the public discourse because it's, it's a hard concept for people that aren't trained in the academic world to, to deal with, not to mention decolonization. So I think what's happened is that the activists are lacking that analysis. They're lacking an end game. They're lacking a program. They're doing great work as, as activists, but it's work that's sort of limited. And, the, and many of the academics are writing about this issue, but they stop short of where do we go with it? What we've done is we've taken the settler colonial analysis and we've developed a political program. What does decolonizing settler colonialism mean? We've thought it through to a post-liberation, post-colonial kind of reality. And I think that that is a tremendous contribution. Whether we succeed or not in the end politically, I think already we've made a very strong contribution. 
And so uh, what I'm hoping over this evening uh, and, and as we keep working is that we can begin to insert a political program, an end game into our actions because human rights is not enough. Nobody's gonna give you your human rights and human rights are very abstract. If they're not connected to a political program, they don't mean very much. Protest, even resistance, even sumud <coughs> isn't enough. We have to summon power. We have to organize. We have to have a strategy. We have to have a program. We have to have a vision. And then I really do believe together, I think together with Awad, that we can mobilize the international civil society in a very powerful way. But that's the missing piece that I think uh, our group is trying to, uh, is trying to uh, contribute to the struggle. So I'll leave it at that and then we'll talk more later. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Uh, Haleda, you're up next. Great, thank you, Bob. Thank you, all the organizers of this um, of this panel. Thank you to my co-panelists and to everyone that is attending. Um, I think this is a very pertinent discussion. Um, one that, as Awad kind of referred to, is being had by Palestinians. Um, I think I engage in it in some in some way or another daily. But there are a lot of components, and to pick up, I guess, on what. Um, Jeff alluded to about where we are going into one state versus two states. And he said something that is, uh, I think I, I agree with the two state, we keep saying it's dying, it's dead. We put in the last nail, it's deeply buried. It's not being resurrected. Um, but we should think about the two state that really never was. For me personally, it never was because the two state that was always envisioned or talked about was based on you know, the guidelines that Israel put forth and Israel being recognized as a Jewish state and being myself from, although I'm an American citizen, being from 48 as Awad is, that always meant Israel maintaining its, you know, um, its insistence that Israel be a Jewish state, a state for the Jewish people. And therefore those of us that um, have citizenship inside those of us, that, those that were kicked out would never have equal rights. We would always be less than. And so that is a non-starter. I know as, as Jeff said, uh, human rights are not enough, but it, it must be the foundation of where we start human rights and equal rights for everyone that's involved. And that is that was never the uh, foundation that of the two-state solution. In fact, the parties, uh, Israel and the, the United States found inserting international human rights and humanitarian law or human rights law as an obstacle to negotiations at Oslo. And despite Palestinian insistence, um, those were not made the crux of the negotiations, again, because they were considered an obstacle. Human rights and equal rights must never be an obstacle. So that needs to be the center of where we are. And, you know, if we look at promoting a, a one state solution or putting forth a political program, I very much respect what has been done and, and agree. Because not only is a, a two state solution, I think was never viable for, for me personally, from a human rights perspective. And as, as Jeff said, we don't really have time to talk about it, but maybe we will, that Israel never intended to have a, a kind of two state solution, but the whole framework by which they, they were calling a conflict and an occupation, it, it was never that. We try to apply kind of international law to what Israel is doing and it's almost now difficult because the, the law of occupation does not ab uh, uh, absorb Israel's project. You know, the law of occupation was uh, a device to handle a, a situation that is post armed conflict a few years until the occupied territory is returned to the normal to the rightful sovereign and they had put laws in place to respect uh, to to respect the human rights of the people that are living in occupied territory that's not what we have with Israel from the beginning it was a project to replace the indigenous people of Palestine with Jews that are living there and that would be brought in in mass to create not a Jewish state in Palestine, but in the name of Ben-Gurion to turn Palestine into a Jewish state. 
Uh, and so therefore, while I say we, you know, we need to put international law, the international law of occupation that doesn't even apply to what Israel has been doing. But we do know if we base human rights, equal rights, and start off from there, then the two state solution that's envisioned will not work. Israel won't accept it because that would require Israel to be a state for all of its citizens and not grant rights based on ethnicity or religion. And in that sense, if we were talking about that, and I've been saying this for like 20 years, I don't care if it's two states, one state or 20 states, it doesn't matter as long as the government that is put in place is a, a government that represents all its people and all its people have a chance to participate in it equally, elect the people that are representing them, and then the laws will be applied equally to all the people living in the territory. And again, that's not the two states that has been on the books that has been envisioned. And so that that is a non-starter. Practically speaking, I do agree that one democratic state uh, for all the people living in the region is, is probably the best option. The question is, and, and Jeff is saying, we need to put forward a political program. The question is, who is we? And, I, and as Awad was saying, you know, Palestinians are discussing this all the time. Palestinians recognize that we have a leadership that doesn't represent its people. You know, we have a, a framework of the Palestine Liberation Organization that was founded in, the, in 1964 to represent the Palestinian people all over the globe. Interestingly, the Palestine Liberation Organization, its original program was one democratic state for all of its people. And that only started to change in the early 70s. And then that was kind of cemented or finalized a change in program of the PLO with the signing of the Oslo Accords. Although, you know, some things happened earlier that also indicated that the PLO was changing. But officially, they uh, changed, well, let me say in 88, when they recognized or when they declared, Palestinians declared an independent state and recognized UN Resolution 242, which was really based on the 1967 borders. But then Oslo entered us into this process of, of trying to establish two states and the Palestine Liberation Organization um, changed its uh, goal really and changed its, its whole um, existence really from a liberation movement to a, a state building um, institution or it changed its program from one of liberation to one of state building and everything that came after that we established the, the PA, the Palestine, the Palestinian Authority of course does not represent Palestinians all over the world and Palestinians all over the world now feel a, a bit lost but have been working for really also a couple of, of decades on, on pushing for reform within the Palestine Liberation Organizations, not wanting to abandon it because we recognize that it was a historical achievement, not wanting to abandon it, but wanting to reform it. And it has not been totally successful yet, but I'm not necessarily giving up hope yet. We saw even um, uh, Dr. Hanan Ashrawi with her recent resignation, emphasizing that the institution needs to be reformed, needs to be more representative, needs to bring in new voices and needs to bring in more women's voices. So I'm personally hoping that she will kind of help uh, lead or push for a, a true reformation so that Palestinians around the world can feel more represented because we have a lot to give wherever we are and we have a right to participate in our national liberation project. Now, I think that that is an important component of putting forward a political program is that you do have Palestinian leadership. Right now we have a leadership that is, or a so-called leadership that is not representing what the people want, that is not representing even what the majority of the world, forget just the Palestinians, recognize is, is feasible or desirable or fair. Um, and that is, that is a problem. That is a problem that we need to work on as Palestinians. And this is not like pushing Jews or Israelis out at all, but it is to say that I think the uh, a liberation movement uh, that puts forward a political program should be led by Palestinians with, of course, Jews and Israelis um, a, a part of that. But I believe that it needs to be, a, a Palestinian liberation movement needs to be uh, led by Palestinians. 
and therefore we have that issue of Palestinian leadership right now. And finally, I will say that despite this, because I don't want to seem at all uh, pessimistic, I'm actually very hopeful. I'm sorry if I've gone over time. I'm hopeful because despite the fact that we have a, a Palestinian leadership that doesn't represent us and that is, is failing us in many ways, we have organizations, Palestinians around the world, great organizations like JVP and ICAD and institutes, uh, I can't even name them all, um, that are doing incredible grassroots work that are working to change the politics in various countries that have contributed and, and financed Israel's settler colonial project. And I think Beth is going to talk a lot more about that, but that is very positive. The alliances that we're building, alliances that did exist when the PLO was a liberation movement and, and actually realized the importance of creating these, uh, of, of building true solidarity with other national liberation movements when we moved, when the PLO moved into the kind of the state building enterprise, abandoned that for the most part. And I think grassroots activists around the world are rebuilding that, reconnecting, and, and a lot of advancements are being made in that way. And I think that we continue doing this. And I, uh, so I'm not opposed to, Jeff, what you said at all, but I, th I think that um, we need to put this forward, be done with the two states solution, push forward something that is based on equal rights, human rights for all, and, and modeling it as one state. And as that develops, maybe we can move everybody else away from even, you know, harking back to the failed two state idea to begin with. Um, I'll leave it there, a lot more to say, but um, maybe we'll leave it to the question and answer period. Thank you. Okay, Beth. Thanks, Bob. Um, Wow, that's a, quite the panel to go last on. Everyone, um, I'm really, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, it was really a pleasure to hear the three of you speak to this. Um, what I'd like to focus on, because I think that the three co-panelists who went before me spoke really eloquently about the idea of the one state solution and the idea of kind of moving forward this political program. I really want to focus in specifically on um, the U.S. right now and what kind of things we can be doing under the Biden administration, um, cause, you know, as we head into this kind of new, this new period of time. And I want to start, Hoeda, where you just left us left off, which is this idea of solidarity. Um, I think that what we have seen happen, not just in the US, but across the globe, is that there's an, an attempt to use this issue to rupture communities and to rupture connections that are very, very natural between and across communities. And so I think the, the, the most important thing for us to keep in mind with all of this and throughout this whole conversation is this idea of solidarity, right? And the importance of showing over and over again that we know that our liberations are intertwined, that we know that until Palestinians are free, None of us are really going to be free. And so in the US, the organizing that we're doing and across the world, the, the grassroots organizing that we're seeing, the most powerful versions of it come when we're having genuine uh, uh, movements that stand together and show that safety comes through solidarity. That's where we all get our safety from. It's from standing together and standing up for one another's liberations. Um, so keeping that in mind, what does this mean then as we head into a Biden administration? How can we evaluate where we're at in this moment where we're coming out of the madness that has been the last four years under Trump and Netanyahu being the best of friends together? Um, and now we're heading into the Biden administration, which I think we can all safely expect will look a lot like the Obama administration, which was no friend to Palestinians, right? And which uh, saw settlement expansion, saw the biggest military funding package we've ever given to Israel and um, did really nothing to hold the Israeli government accountable for its apartheid rule over Palestinians. Um, having said that, I also feel a lot of hope and a lot of optimism about where we're heading next and about the next year. I think the Biden administration, the executive branch is never going to be where change happens right? It's, it's got always going to be the last piece to move on this issue. Having said that, I think there's a lot of room for a really powerful advocacy to move the U.S. government to hold the Israeli government accountable on these issues. Um, and I think that the most important thing as we push the, as we push to do this and as we 
push to, you know, the reason I'm focusing on the US government, in addition, because it's, it's my area of work, is because we know the US government is, you know, sending $3.8 billion a year to fund this apartheid, to fund this oppression, to prevent any sort of future in which all people are actually free and living in justice and with full rights. Um, and I think that while it is uh, depressing to think about the kinds of things the Biden administration might try to pull us back into, there is a robust debate happening in Congress on this issue. And there are even more robust debates happening at the local level on this issue. And the reason they're happening is because constituents are calling for it, because of the work that our movements have been doing for decades, led by Palestinian organizers across the United States. Because of that work, we have forced our representatives to talk about it in new ways. And this is all relative, right? Like I'm saying this knowing that it's still not even close to where we should be in Congress right now. And I think it's important that we recognize the progress that we've made and that's available to us. I think that next year as we head into the 117th Congress, we're heading into some very serious tipping point years on this issue um, in a way that I think can have major ramifications out. And I think we can gain a lot of steam in pushing forward a future in which all people are actually living in justice, freedom, and equality. Um, we're closing out this congressional session with two bills on the table that would condition military funding to Israel. Both of those bills, both introduced by Representative McCollum, one that focus on children's rights, one that focus on annexation, both of those bills are on the one hand, historic, and on the other hand, they're not enough, right? The situation is so dire right now, we need to be ending military funding to Israel, and instead we're just talking about conditioning it. And so I think what we have to do is hold this tension between one, knowing that we're not near where the conversation needs to be, and two, recognizing that this is progress, this is movement, and this is when we push harder than ever for accountability. And I could not agree more with Huweda when, uh, Huweda, when you mentioned that, you know, I think the thing that we, the way to center this conversation in so many ways, and it's not De not decoupling it from the broader political ideas, but the way to center the conversation, especially in the US, um, is to talk about rights and equality and justice, right? That those things all are intertwined with one another and that's how we get to liberation and freedom. And that's the way that we can push this conversation forward. And what that also means is that the big push for us, I think when we're working on this in the US is going to be to force the, force the centering of people force the centering of Palestinians. And that's not, that is not a radical idea at all. It should be the most obvious thing in the world to start by talking about the people who are most directly impacted by oppression and, and that, let that be the thing that drives the conversation forward. Um, but instead what we often see is kind of this broadening of the issue where we lose sight completely of who's impacted how. Um, and I think that the more we can recenter things to focus on people first and focus on how Palestinians are harmed by Israel's apartheid rule, the more we can push this conversation forward in new ways and actually take steps to truly force the US government to hold the Israeli government more accountable. And I say this knowing that, again, this is a long road, right? We're, this isn't gonna happen in this Congress, but that's where the fight is. And that's what the vehicle, th those are the ways we get vehicles going to force these conversations more and more and more. And I truly believe that it's good for us to force these conversations, right? We need to be forcing our representatives to say yes or no to us on these issues constantly and forcing them to talk about it. And again, that only happens when our movements are building and when our base is building. And it, that they are, you know, and I think that, um, uh, Awad, you mentioned at the very beginning that Palestinian resistance and the Palestinian freedom movement used to be central and part of the broader international progressive movement. And my feeling is that that's happening again. I think that that's very much re resurging right now. Um, and I think in the US, we can see that, right? We can see the challenging of this idea of the PEP, the idea, you know, often we refer to people who are progressive except for Palestine. When in fact, we know that there's no such thing as someone who's progressive except for Palestine. If you aren't progressive in a way that you know Palestinians deserve right and freedom, just like everyone else, then no, you are not progressive. And I think that idea is growing in the grassroots. It's growing in understanding in the left 
in the US and that is reverberating out. And we're seeing that that's a powerful message to send. And then separately and to that, um, there's a broader, there's a growing progressive foreign policy anti-war movement in this country that I think is slowly pick, you know, picking up steam again, thanks in no small part to the horrible Trump foreign policy that we saw for the last four years. And the more we can become central to these other progressive movements that are growing and strengthening, the more we'll all benefit from it and the more we can be just showing that Palestinian rights are one in a long sentence of all the fights that we're having and all the things we're pushing for um, to show that all of our liberations are intertwined and that we can't get to one of them without all of us standing together. Um, so I'll stop there because I think that the Q&A session will probably dive in a lot deeper to a lot of these issues. Thank you. Okay, thank you to, to all of you. I, I, I have to say I was struck by something, uh, by the, the different approaches that, that seem to underlie what Beth just said and what Jeff said earlier. Beth really said we have to, and I think it may be a result either of, of a generational difference or of the different locations Beth in the US and Jeff in Israel. <clears throat> Beth said, we have to keep focusing and emphasizing on uh, the on, on notion of equality and equal rights. Jeff said, if, if I heard him correctly, that he's been talking about equality and equal rights for years. And what he really wants to hear now, wants to focus on is, a political program to get us there. Um, how do we how do we how do we square those to what could be diametrically opposite uh, emphases in the struggle to, to unite Palestinians in terms of strategies how to do it and and also to to get the allies here. Uh, on at least uh, in the ballpark. Uh, Jeff, you want to go first? Uh, <clears throat> sure. It also, it also relates back to what Hawaii said actually about, because um, I hear this sometimes, I don't care if it's one state, two states, 10 states, just as long as I have my rights, which I have, I have a problem with. Look, I think obviously human rights are important and they're, 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 they're crucial, but human rights were never intended to be a political program. They were intended to be guidelines and principles and uh, maybe a grounding, a certain grounding that you can't fall below, but, but they're, they're disembodied. In other words, if you, you know, someone said to me, I don't care uh, about a program. I just want the refugees to have their rights. Well, what does that mean? I mean, are the refugees to have their rights? I don't, I'm not sure what that means. Who gives rights? I don't think you can get real rights unless you struggle for them. And the only way to struggle for them is through a political program. But let's, you know, but then the questions arise and it's a little bit on the chat here because people are saying, well, you know, what are the three basic elements of a one state or how do we, what are the four stages or what are the, in other words, people right away go from the general to say, okay, well, what does that mean? The ref okay, refugees have a right to return. Do they all return? Where do they return to? What kind of land? You can't separate the issue of rights and freedom and equality from a political program. You've got to have answers to people that say, how does their freedom impact my freedom? How do their rights impact my rights? How do we live together after 100 years of conflict, so-called? How do we... These are all kinds of issues that unless we can address them in a very, I think in a very detailed way, actually, uh, we end up, you know, it, it's too vague. We really have to have a program. Now, the program can be argued out. Um, and, and obviously we're very, you know, I think our program is, is very good in that we've thought it through, but it's not the program. I mean, there's a, you know, a lot of more people have to participate. There's all kinds of issues that are open-ended. Um, uh, freedom, equality, and rights are obviously at the center of our of our program. But how do you actually? How do you actually? How does it work? 
how does it how do we actually govern how do we actually have an economy how do we actually share the land how do we actually bring security and rights to people these are concrete questions that i think unless we have answers for them people aren't going to be convinced uh so that i i really think that we have to we have to balance these kinds of ideals and and the very important i mean i'm not discounting them, but the, the very important guidelines of human rights has to be balanced with a real, with a real program. I mean, that's, I, I just, I just maybe, uh, okay, I, you know, maybe just become, because I'm here. <laughs> um, I just know my, the reaction every time when people, when, when, when I talk about, you know, Palestinians, I mean, it, it brings up a hundred issues. Well, we have answers to those issues. I think one thing our the One Democratic State campaign has done through our discussions of the 10 points and all kinds of discussions that we've generated is we're beginning to block out, not answers, maybe that's not the right word, but we're beginning to block out responses to people's questions. The questions keep coming back all the time. How do the refugees return? You know, what does equal rights mean? What about collective rights? What about you know different national rights? Should it be binational? Should it be you know what? I mean, there's all kinds of issues here that are really that are really crucial. How does can you decolonize Palestine without dealing with the wider Middle East? What's the relation between the Palestinian struggle and the struggle in general? As Awad was starting to say, so I just think that that we have to begin to be really practical and really address head on the issues that people bring up uh, in order that we, that we uh, come up with a program that's first of all is doable. And I think we have to see ourselves, maybe that's the problem that I, that I, I, I think in some ways we don't see ourselves as political actors, you know, on the left. I think this isn't only the problem of the Palestinians, I think in general, the left, we see ourselves as gadflies, we see ourselves as critique, you know, critics, we see ourselves as, uh, advocates for this or that, but we never really in some ways jump into the political arena. And if well, you jump into the political arena, you've got to offer an alternative to what, what's, uh, what's, what everybody, you know, Netanyahu has his alternative, Trump has his ultimate deal, everybody else has their deals. What is, that, what is our deal? Okay, what are we so, selling? What are we offering? And I think that's, that's, from my point of view, the missing piece. All right, so I want to I want to give uh, both uh, Beth and then Huayda a, a, a chance to to respond to Jeff, and then I want to ask Awad something related mm -hmm. to it. Uh, but but Beth, I, it, I, it's so interesting because because as I understand it, JVP has specifically refrained from taking a position on one state or two states. And, and it has, I think, uh, uh, one of the reasons for that is the, the concern about dividing rather than uniting the allies in the movement. Um, but what Jeff is, is really saying is, really in order to make progress, we need to, to have a political, uh, a more, of a, a more of a specific political plan. Uh, what sayest thou? <laughs> yeah, I think that actually the reason comes back to this idea, and I think Hueda, you mentioned it first, is what do we say when we mean we? Um, I strongly believe that it is not the place of American Jews to determine what will happen, right? Like, I don't, I don't think that's our place to say or to, to, to do. Um, and again, I'm speaking very specifically about American Jews, and, and by that, and you know, JVP represents is a Jewish American organization that has a broad uh, base of people who include many allies who are not Jewish, but that's the organization we are, and that's the that's kind of who we represent. So I think that, you know, it's really interesting because I, I don't actually really disagree, I think, Jeff, with a lot of what you're saying. I think that the idea of talking about what will happen and building up and really getting very concrete about what a one state solution could look like, I believe is key and critical. Um, and when I spoke about what, what I spoke about, I mean very specifically about um, organizing in the US under a Biden administration and the tactics and strategies we use when we do that. Um, 
And again, who is the we and who is the audience in any given moment? And I think that it's useful for us to really broaden out big and think about the diversity of tactics and strategies that can exist within this movement. Um, and to think about what are we saying to who, when? And always, I, I mean that always being very true and very transparent about what our values are and what we are fighting for. Um, and who are our audiences in any given moment? And when we're talking, for example, to Congress, I truly believe that it is not going to move forward the cause of, pal of Palestinian liberation to go in and say, we need a bill calling for one, a one state solution. I think then we can fall into a trap that actually is quite similar to the trap we've already fallen into in Congress, which is that people above all else, we see Congress prioritizing the two state solution, very specifically Democrats I'm talking about actually, many Republicans are not calling for that. Um, and when we see Democrats who have prioritize and believe that above all else, the end game must be the two state solution, they've lost sight of everything else. And that's why they're refusing to hold Israel accountable. And that's why they, they refuse to get on bills that they should be on and, and fight for real justice and equality. I think that we could, they can lose sight of it. And so similarly, I think that um, it, would, it shouldn't be the place of US Congress to determine what the solution should be, right? The place of US Congress should be to ensure that US tax dollars are not funding apartheid. And so I think I was speaking very specifically about those conversations that we're having in the US and how we can move Congress under a Biden administration toward these broader goals of equality and justice in a sustainable way. Um, and again, I think the question really is, who is the we and who is the they in any given moment that we're talking about and to? And I do think that it's really useful for us to hold a broad range of tactics and messaging tools within this, this broader fight for Palestinian freedom. Um, Poet, I'm really curious to hear your, your thoughts on this as well. Okay, so yeah, let's move to the, to the we, to, to Hawaida and Awad on this, on this subject. Um, Hawaida? Well, no, I agree very much with what um, Beth said. And I, again, I don't know if I made it very clear, but I, I do believe in the importance of figuring out, as Jeff said, like all the minutiae as we can, like what a one state or what a solution that is workable, that is acceptable, that is based on um, justice rights, would look like and that the one democratic state group is working some of these things out I think is wonderful and I think it can be used in advocacy for but it's just hard for me to um you know like for example Jeff when when you say we need to move into that like we need to start putting that out there for example who just the one democratic state group becoming a political party and then it's a political party that is where exactly? I, I think that what I was trying to say is we need to, as Palestinians, work on our representation and the Palestinian and the Palestinian leadership being representative, and then hopefully adopting the the, the work that you've done and um, and others and moving forward. I think that we need to keep pushing. Maybe even not even talking about two states anymore. It's dead. It's gone. It's not workable. Um, because we need to erase it. The fact that it still exists kind of in Congress and on everybody's plate, even those that are uh, friendly or that support Palestinian rights is, is nauseating. Um, but we need to keep kind of doing the work to change the language, to change th the way that this situation is viewed. And I think a lot has been done as I think it was you, Jeff, that mentioned that at first we were talking about occupation back in 2000. I remember we were just trying to get the media to say it was occupation as opposed to a conflict. And then now they're saying, uh, some will say it's an occupation, but it's not even an occupation where it is settler colonialism. And that is creeping up like it isn't in the academic world. Even some of the, the in international human rights, it was almost a decade ago that the special rapporteur on, on human rights in Palestine and in the occupied territory talked about the fact that the, the traditional international human rights humanitarian law framework does not seem to apply to what Israel is doing and we should probably start looking at a more a, a settler framework as far as the the law is concerned so even the law is moving there but let's let's keep talking about it. let's keep expanding on it and let's continue our work um, like the advocacy that Beth was talking about boycott divestment of sanction is very important because we have a, a lot of forces and well-funded forces obviously working against us. And I'm not just talking about like the Sheldon Adelsons and AIPAC and whatnot, but those that 
try to put forward or present us as being kind of a radical and and anti peace or a little bit extremist whereas in fact <coughs> this is kind of relevant because i saw just the other day that there is going to be this big gala on december 15th celebrating the fact that uh, in the new budget there's allocated 250 million dollars to the alliance for middle east peace which includes all of these various organizations, all of them normalization kind of organizations that include very little Palestinians on them. But um, so it's like the, you're going to have forces pushing for this kind of normalizing the situation. And those of us that are saying that, no, we need to uh, push to isolate Israel because I, Israel is a settler colonial project that is not going to just decide one day to give up its power because it suddenly believes in the human rights and equality of Palestinian people when they have been working against that for over seven decades. No, it has to be forced to do that by the power of the people in, in, in making it very costly for Israel to do that. And I remember, and I brought this up a lot recently because it really, it, it struck me in a, um, an op-ed written by Nelson Mandela's grandson. A, a few months ago, he said the allies of the anti-apartheid movement never even asked us to negotiate with our colonizers. It was freedom first, and then we sit and then we decide what that looks like. We're not negotiating our rights away. And the fact that Palestinians are constantly being told to sit and, and negotiate, which negotiation means kind of giving up your rights when that's what we are negotiating for is unacceptable. So Kind of taking and then when we turn against negotiations it's like we're extremists and look at these kind of peace groups and let's throw our money at them uh these are some of the things that we are fighting but as we're building alliances and educating and i think that equal rights needs to be at the center of our kind of education changing the dialogue all of that goes into advancing i think the framework that you're talking about jeff and what we want to see in the end so i'm very much supportive it's just jumping ahead when you have a leadership that's kind of not there and and not representative is a little bit problematic i hope i'm making sense a uh, um you you know you you started out your remarks by talking about the necessity to unite the palestinian people to work outside the political structure and the network that would ignite the imagination of the world one of our uh, one of those watching uh, today uh, pointed out in the chat that many Palestinians seem to want two states, and that the Palestinians are not united on an end game. Now, my question to you is, and of course you're free to comment on anything that's, that that has been has been said already, but can Palestinians unite around one state? Would the focus on one state help? to unite the Palestinians or, or detract from the effort to unite Palestinians? Uh, yeah, I uh, uh, think that uh, on the long term, the one state uh, unites the Palestinian people and can mobilize them, but I'm not saying that this will happen automatically. You know, uh, we have the problem of uh, representation. It is a serious problem because the Palestinian leadership today does not represent the Palestinians. It has lost its revolutionary legitimacy as well as elector electoral legitimacy because Abu Mazen, for example, has not been, has been there for 14 years without being elected. So we have, I have said from the very beginning that we have problem with the current leadership. So it is the onus is on, 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 on the uh, grassroots movements on those critical Palestinian forces. And uh, we call it uh, the third stream. The third stream is not organized yet. The third stream includes tens of initiatives, uh, groups, uh, academic, uh, 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 popular resistance. I mean, there are, the Palestinians are dynamic in their uh, challenging the current situation in terms of the uh, existing Palestinian leadership and also in terms of the colonial regime in Palestine. So, I mean, and the, 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 the discourse of the human rights does not contradict one democratic state because where will you practice the human, your human rights? It's, it's going to be in a political 
in, in, in a polity. I mean, you are not going to practice that outside the states. This will happen inside the state. So we need a state. And uh, we focus because the essence of the one democratic states is human rights. Because when we say that uh, equality, what does it mean equality? When you say that the Palestinian refugees should go back to Palestine and, and exercise uh, uh, their uh, citizenship as they were before 48, because those are citizens of Palestine. They will come back and re 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 return, be rehabilitated, restore uh, their, uh, their properties and uh, live a, a normal life. So, I mean, there is no, and the, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the rights uh, discourse, it's important, but in, in fact, it has its own limitation because it doesn't talk about history and the history goes back to 1948. From their Palestinians meet, their Palestinians were the victim of ethnic cleansing. There was the starting point of, or the dynamic, the dynamic of, of, of reproducing the Palestinian uh, uh, identity. So, uh, by the way, uh, what we need now is a clear vision. So the Palestinians lack a vision. Before the PLO abandons anti-colonial struggle, uh, there was Palestinians were uh, knew what they wanted. They were around one political game, the liberation of Palestine. The world said, okay, you liberate Palestine, this means that you want to exterminate the Jews. Then the Palestinians said, no, we want a secular democratic state. And that was in 1969, and that was enshrined in the national document. It was said clearly that the Palestinians are aspiring for a secular democratic state where all Palestinians, Jews, can also live as uh, equal citizens. So then they came under pressure from the world to, so that they can get a, a state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. And the Palestinians thought that really this would happen. But what happened since then is that we are left with no state, independent state. We are not only, but more dangerously is that we have been left without an a liberational tool. The PLO, we lost the PLO. The PLO is not a subordinated to the Palestinian Authority, which is coordinating uh, security with the Israelis, which in fact has become part of the colonial regime. So now the Palestinians don't believe that there's going to be two-state solution. And uh, the recent poll uh, in Ramallah, it is uh, the PS, uh, I can't remember exactly how it is pronounced in English, but it said that 39 people support the one democratic state. This in contrast, to two or three years poll ago uh, before, in which uh, the, 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 the rate amounted to 19%. So, I mean, people are, and by the way, 62% don't believe that two-state solution is going to happen. It's right that the Palestinian leadership, the current leadership doesn't believe in the one democratic state. And although though Abu Mazen even himself sometimes hints to that, that if the Israelis don't want to accept to the solution, we will move to one state. And that is bad because he uses that as a scare tactic. We don't think that this should be used as a scare tactic because one democratic state is a noble idea and this should be exported to the Israelis as a good state, not as a something that would uh, uh, frighten them. They, we should be presented as a, the most, uh, the best solution that can really not only can provide security to the Palestinians and, 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 and equality, but also to the Israelis. This is the only way that Palestinians and Israelis can live together. And uh, we, uh, and but this is the only uh, clear vision that, that can we, we can provide. So I would say that from my experience as a Palestinian activist who uh, have been, uh, who has been active since, since 40 years, since my young age, and I was a co-founder of a movement called Abna al-Balad. Abna al-Balad, this is a political movement within 1948, which advocated for one democratic state. We thought that we were part of the Palestinian national movement. And we strongly believed in one democratic state. But obviously, at that time, we were not mature enough to figure out, to imagine how this will happen. But we were, because the PLO had uh, embraced the one democracy said, we thought that we are part of the Palestinian base. Of course, we were on the left of the Israeli Communist Party, which believed in two state solution. And our aim was really to preserve the Palestinian identity of the Palestinians in Israel, because Israel wanted from the very beginning to severe our cultural roots and to isolate us from the rest of the Palestinian people, from the rest of the Arab world, and 
to consider us as Israelis without giving us equality. So we have been there for 70 years now. We have been employing peaceful means. We never resorted to violence and we are not related to as equal citizens. Not only that, but they have issued the, the so-called Jewish uh, nation state law, which specifically uh, said to us that you will never be an equal, equal citizen. So the Palestinian leadership conceded the unity of the Palestinian people because under pressure from the international community, the leadership thought that they will get an independent state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. They excluded the Palestinians, Oslo excluded the Palestinians and Israel from the conflict. We were not related as a part of the conflict and we were not also not also a part of the, of the solution. So we thought that after Oslo, because we were left alone, we thought that we will build a movement inside the Green Line, another movement to ask for equal rights in Israel. We raised the slogan of a state for all its citizens, and we are part of the Palestinian people, but we want to be equal citizens in the state of Israel. But we said for the first time, a political party emerges in Israel saying that we will not get equality without the abolishing of the Jewish character of the state of Israel, without dismantling the legal system, the racist legal, political and legal system in Israel. And we also, our analysis was that the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza Strip is only an extension of the regime that existed in Israel before. The occupation is not temporary. Israel from the very beginning wanted that this occupation will be permanent. This is a colonial and occupation is a misleading, a misleading term. And this is why we also in the one market state, we, we are making political education that we should restore, reclaim the, 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 the original uh, political discourse, the liberational discourse that Israel is an, uh, is an apartheid regime, is a colonial regime and the Palestinian movement or the Palestinian cause is a national liberation cause. And the Palestinian national movement is, is, is a national, uh, national labor mov a movement. And the conflict in Palestine is not a conflict between two symmetrical sides. We were colonized. We were invaded from alien group that came from outside. This is, we have to restore the, 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 the legal lexicon so that we can uh, make a, a, a correct analysis of the state of Israel, of the conflict. And from that, we, uh, we, 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 uh, 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 get it, the, 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 the solution. If we agree that Israel is a settler colonial state, then the solution should be one democratic state. We should dismantle the existing regime by a, a democratic, by a real democracy where all people can, can, can live together. So what is needed now is a clear vision. The national, the ANC, was consistent in its advocacy and its advo advo uh, advocating for, for one man, one vote. That is one state. So, but the Palestinian national movement, in fact, moved from the liberation of Palestine to secure the market state to uh, an interim uh, solution in the West Bank and Gaza Strip to a two-state two solution, then to a Pantustan like state. So now we are all under a single system of control, a single system of domination and colonialism which should be dismantled and the world should know that this will take time. And what is the challenge before us is that we should work outside the Palestinian leadership as going back to your questions because the Palestinians are not united. It's right that the leadership, either Hamas and Fatah, they are not embracing the one democratic state, but we believe that we are going to pressure them. We are going to force them by uh, intensive and daily activism inside the Kremlin before they, I understand what, what Huayda and, and Beth said outside because, uh, uh, because they think they can't decide on, 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 on behalf of the Palestinian people. So this will take time. So we have to, to work uh, uh, continuously uh, so that we can build a broad coalition uh, with uh, most of the Palestinian groups and initiatives and uh, uh, reach to uh, a consensus uh, around uh, the one democratic state. And this is what you see that, that things are changing slowly, but steadily. This is what we are doing now. Thank you. Uh, 
Well, Jeff, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll let you comment on, on what you've heard, but I, I, I do wanna ask you some questions about the one democratic state, because when I talk about it with people here, um, I always get the question, you know, well, what, what does the political and governmental structure look like? How, how can you set up a state where two people two peoples with definite national aspirations uh, decide that sharing the land or sharing a state is more important than vindicating those, uh, those national uh, uh, aspirations. And uh, I'm all, you know, often the reaction is, um, you know, relatedly, among American Jews, well, uh, one state means the end of a Jewish state, means the end of Zionism, um, the end of a place where Jew, Jews can, can rule themselves. So, so what is it in the program that, that gives you a sense that, um, that putting it front and center is gonna advance the ball now and one last question from a, an audience member is revival and restructuring of the PLO as a representative political organization, part of the strategy and tactics of the One Democratic State campaign. And Awad, you can comment on that as well uh, uh, after Jeff. I'll be brief because we're starting to run out of time. I just want to preface by by referencing uh, a couple of things that uh, uh, clarifying something uh, in terms of what Hawaii was saying too. When I say we, <laughs> um, the the one democratic state campaign is a Palestinian led campaign. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll let Awad expand on that if he wants to. In other, in other words, we're all going to be part of the one state. I mean. You know, we, I'm a stakeholder as well as an Israeli Jew. And so I have to be involved. And it's, I think it actually strengthens the movement to have Israeli Jews involved. But it's clear that, that um, the movement has to be led by Palestinians. And, uh, and then, of course, you get the, the, the next part of the agenda that Awad referred to in terms of uniting the Palestinian people. Is the degree that 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 the uh, that the democratic state that emerges will be largely Palestinian in character, will have a Palestinian majority to it, uh, and will be a part of the wider Middle East and the wider Palestinian people, uh, means that that whole agenda is a Palestinian agenda. I can't be involved in uh, deciding, you know, what the Palestinianness of the of the of the state should be, but in terms of the political struggle. I think uh, the way I use the word we is we the stakeholders here, uh, you know, are in a common, are in a common anti-colonial struggle. And I think one of the things we're fighting to tell you the truth, this has to do with this issue of conflict versus settler colonialism. Because one of the things we're fighting is, is anti-normalization. In other words, anti-normalization is, is important. I mean, I, I'm certainly against normalization from the point of view of, of, of what anti-normalization means. Uh, and we've always supported, um, um, you know, the Palestinian uh, call uh, against uh, normalization. But it's gotten to a point today, you know, in the Palestinian call, normalization in 2000, the year 2000 was defined. And if an Israeli organization accepted the three principles that later became part of BDS, uh, equal rights for Palestinians in Israel, end of occupation, the, the right of return, working with them was not considered normalization. But what's happened is over the years, there's been an erosion. So that today, many Palestinians will not work with Israelis at all. You know, I can't go to Birzit University, for example. Amira Haas got thrown off Birzit University at one point. And I think that's a real problem. And so part of the transition from the idea of conflict to settler colonialism is conflict is sides. 
So I can understand the Palestinian saying, you know, your side has oppressed my side, and I really I'm not in the mood <laughs> to to work with you. I can understand that completely. But if you redefine the conflict as an anti-colonial conflict, as was done in South Africa, then it breaks down in a completely different way. The anti-colonial forces, whoever they are, against those that 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 are continuing to support the colonial venture. So I think that it, 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 it you know, that that um, there is a we in terms of the anti-colonial forces, but in terms of the but the we has to be led again by Palestinians. It's about it is a Palestinian struggle. It's a struggle that I have a, a certain role in and a certain stake in. But I think that that's clear that uh, that uh, that at least the one Democratic state, state campaign is a uh, is a Palestinian led campaign, and uh, and in terms of just to mention about about a little bit to, what Beth was saying, you know our I think our our idea we go back to the South Africa idea is less governments. I don't think we, we know that Israeli Jews are not gonna be a part of the anti-apartheid struggle or the anti-colonial struggle, we know that. So we're not trying to buy, you know, we'd like to get as many as possible to buy in, but we're not gonna waste our time going door to door, trying to convince Israelis to end occupation or end colonialism. And I think the same is true in some ways of governments. You know, the ANC didn't have any expectation the governments in the beginning would come to, it, to, to its aid. So it organized, I think this is our strategy is to go to the international civil society, to go to trade unions, to go to intellectuals and students and all the different activist groups that exist in human rights groups and political groups and so on, religious groups and mobilize them and through them to change government policies. So I don't, I mean, the whole idea that we would support a bill in Congress from Betty McCollum saying there should be one state is, of course, a, you know, I don't know, you, you didn't mean that seriously. But I think there's a question here in terms of the division of labor, because you're right. Your job as an American isn't to liberate Palestine, although to support liberation for sure. Whereas uh, we don't really think that we can be involved in uh, in getting Congress to make any real, I think Congress has to be forced by public opinion and civil society. Uh, so that would be our strategy more is working to mobilize civil society around a program rather than trying to work with governments per se. Uh, and finally, just the last point to, to, to relate to, to Bob's question about Israelis. You know, I think it's just like, I think it is like South Africa. You know, that we have to create a situation where the Israeli Jews just don't have a choice. You know, it's not a matter, we're not gonna negotiate, they're not gonna agree. We have to create a situation in which Israeli Zionist settler colonialism becomes unsustainable and it collapses. And I think that's, I think that's doable actually. I don't think Israel is as strong as people, as people think it is. It's strong in governments, it is not strong in public opinion, in the in the court of public opinion, and so we could create a situation where uh, where it could start to be isolated. That's where BDS fits in, but BDS as a part of a political program, not as a standalone operation, and and in a sense force it on the Israelis. And then I think what we're doing, you know, I think Awad Awad said at the beginning that that the uh, South Africans, the ANC, are, are one of our models. And what they did in 1955 is had the, the, the Freedom Charter that said to the whites in South Africa, you are a part of the new South Africa. We're all South Africans. He knew, they knew that, that it wasn't gonna convince the whites to end apartheid, but once apartheid was forced to end, the whites could be a part of the transition because they saw that it wasn't against them, that they had a role in the new state. And that I think is part of what our program is uh, is saying, and that is that um, that this isn't against Jews, it's not against Israelis. This is for the liberation of all of us, really. There's another there's the we in that sense as well, and so uh, and so uh, we know that you're not going to cooperate in decolonization. But when we get to a point where there's no choice, 
we hope that you will take advantage of the opportunity to build something together because that's being offered in our, in our plan. So that's sort of the way I think we're looking at it. And um, um, yeah, I won't get into the whole leadership issue. I'll let Awad talk about that maybe. Or do I do? Awad, do you wanna, do you wanna take on this question of whether a revival and restructuring of the PLO as a representative political organization is part of the strategy and tactics of the One Democratic State Campaign? And the question is whether the, the PLO can change? Yes, whether restructuring the PLO and making it a representative political organization is part of the strategy and tactics of the One Democratic State campaign. Yeah, sure. I mean, every, every uh, Palestinian activist and every Palestinian initiative, in fact, uh, have uh, centered uh, this demand in their agenda. But uh, unfortunately, this uh, not nothing has happened, uh, uh, and no reform has been done, and this is very frustrating. This is why we continue to demand that we believe, no doubt, that if restructuring the PLO uh, to include also uh, other factions uh, that were not that did not exist when the PLO was formed is important, and also to. Uh, reform or to revisit its uh, vision and its strategy. This is very important, but since it is not possible, I don't, I, in fact, I rule out the possibility that this will happen uh, ever uh, without the pressure, without the real pressure. The real pressure will have to come from below, from the grassroots organization, organization. and this will take time. This requires us a lot of work, uh, patience and uh, even tolerance to each other because, you know, Palestinians should also, those who are critical of the Palestinian leadership should also learn how to work together. It's not easy, I mean, to do networking, you know, because uh, the, uh, the division uh, within the Palestinian national movement has uh, produced a lot of frustration and distrust among even people. So what is needed now is that we who really are interested and in working to reform the PLO, to reunite the Palestinian national movement or to rebuild the Palestinian national movement should know how to work together. I believe that our initiative, the Palestinian, the, the, the One Democratic State campaign has made a, a small but important uh, achievement by uniting uh, a relatively uh, big number of Palestinians who really did not work together before, and even groups, because many groups, even who are which are critical of the Palestinian leadership, did not know how to work together. What you are doing now is we are networking, and every day, in fact, for example, we have uh, the so-called Palestinian Palestine Forum. This Palestine Forum was formed in parallel with our campaign, and not by uh, a common decision, but uh, it was an accident that we started at the same time. But I also uh, uh, a member in the executive, executive committee, seven member executive committee of this, of this forum. This forum includes hundreds of academic, academics, intellectuals, and, uh, and uh, activists. In fact, it started three years ago and with only a few people. And now really it is, it's, uh, it consists of hundreds of people. And all these people, many of them, uh, by the way, support the one democratic state. But what is, uh, what is the vision of this uh, forum, for example, is not to specify the solution. Though some, uh, of course, nobody, no, none of them support the solution, some of them used to support the two solution, but today none of them, but not every one of them have decided uh, that we should embrace now the one democratic state. That means that this is a, a transition from two solution to a one democratic solution or to something between. And that means that indicates that, that uh, indicates to the trajectory that is taking place among the Palestinians. So this forum, for example, is an important, has become known well-known forum. And besides that, there is the BDS, 
we, we, we our campaign. Uh, the, the Palestinians in the exile. This is a conference called the Palestinians in the exile. And there is also the coalition of the uh, right of returns coalition. Uh, so we have uh, some, uh, a number of uh, political groups or uh, frameworks that are working, that are uh, transcending even the, the, the Palestinian constituencies. Yeah, any people, I mean, groups or initiatives which uh, con uh, consists of Palestinians from all of Palestine and from the exile. So that is, uh, that means in my opinion, rebuilding the Palestinian national project, re 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 reclaiming the, the Palestine as one state, reclaiming the Palestinian people as one people. So yeah. there is a tra tra trajectory that is going on and we should rely on that. We should build on that. We should see this where we are going, but uh, uh, we, even if we have not, not all of them have decided to embrace the one democratic state. All this mobilization is very important and crucial. And this, I believe that in the near future, what you call the stream, the third stream will be crystallized as one coalition. Now there is a third stream, but it's not organized. I mean, most initiatives are working separately. What we are doing now that we are doing networking. And so every week, for example, we have a dialogue with one of these groups. And that is maybe some people are not paying attention to what is going, but I think soon people will, be, will, 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 will get to know that uh, besides the frustrating situation of the Palestinian leadership and what is happening in the world, there is something positive that is taking place. By the way, I can see what is what happened in the United States. It's very important. I mean, the dissent within the uh, uh, American uh, jury and uh, also the, the growing strength of the progressives within the Democratic Party and out of the Democratic Party. So there are encouraging things. We are following what is happening there. We are connecting with many of the, our with the active, our friends, the activists who are there, like the, the, the uh, Beth and uh, Waida are there. I mean, we, we, we are in, in, in contact with, with many people there and we really, we are encouraged by that. Okay, thank you a lot. Uh, Huwait, I wanna ask you because uh, Huwait mentioned the Palestinian exile and of course, there's a huge Palestinian diaspora <laughs> Uh, of which you are a representative. Um, do you have any thoughts on how um, the, that diaspora can uh, become better political actors in this struggle? Um, yeah, okay. So I made a lot of notes and things that I wanted to comment on and I know we're out of time, but that is a good question. Let me say that there are a number of Palestinian organizations and groups and activists involved in that. I have been involved in these discussions for years and there are initiatives and new initiatives and trying to learn from also past failures. So that is happening, but Palestinians of the diaspora very much feel that you know, know that we kind of lost representation after Oslo became fragmented and and we need to change that because Palestinians all over the world, some of them are, you know, they, they are abroad because they choose to be, but a lot of them are abroad because that was, situation was forced on them. And even those that are abroad because they choose to be, um, aren't able to co go home freely. And that we acknowledge that that does not mean and we insist that it does not mean that we don't have a place in our national liberation movement. So those discussions are happening. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Maybe you'll hear more about that uh, later. There's just a couple of things I wanted to touch on quickly. And first and foremost, before I forget, I know I put it briefly in the chat, but I really do want to wish everyone celebrating uh, Happy Hanukkah. And hopefully always, you know, wish for more peaceful uh, times that we can all celebrate together. Um, I think I would mention the poll of Palestinian because we were talking about Palestinians accepting and I said, you know, who are the we and Palestinians accept in this one state. And I, the, the poll that I would mentioned is very significant because, you know, in the occupied Palestinian territory, there is, there is no major political party advocating for the one state. And yet you have a percentage like 39% that, that he mentioned 
recently. And even back as far as, you know, 15 years ago, the percentage was still pretty high, about 27, 28% for a situation where, again, no major political party is advocating for one state. People don't know what it looks like or what it means. And a lot of people have just been born into this two state idea. And that is mainly um, just the Palestinians in the occupied Palestinian territories. Now, when you take into consideration Palestinians in the refugee camps and in uh, other places in exile, uh, I am willing to bet that the one state solution is a uh, way more popular than the two state solution. So it's not that we don't accept it, but unfortunately, or that you would need much convincing, even with the Palestine Liberation Organization and those that are now in place that are quote unquote our leaders. Um, you know, it, like I mentioned, the original um, end goal was one democratic state. It was a liberation movement. It wasn't to kick the Jews out. It was to create a, a, a country, a state where everyone could live together. And it is political pressure really from the outside that forced the PLO in order to kind of um, have a place at the table to change their views, to kind of moderate their views, if you will, and start accepting this idea of a, of a two-state solution. And with Oslo, again, the thinking, because I don't think you'll find a Palestinian that says they don't want all of Palestine back. And that's not, again, to say kicking the Jews out. It is to say to be able to go to anywhere in Palestine, our, our historic homeland, and to not be confined to a little uh, Bantustan or a statelet that is envisioned. But why not one place where we can all live together? And this was a question that was asked, you know, with all of the trauma and that Palestinians been, and the oppression that they've been living under, can Palestinians live together with Israelis in, in a dem future democratic state? And according to my experience, I'm just speaking from my experience, yes, uh, I was organizing with Palestinians in some of the most traumatic times on the ground in Palestine where people were getting killed on the streets, massive curfews, and still Palestinians willing to uh, accept and invite Israelis into their homes, Israelis that came as equals and not as occupiers. And not just as equals, but you know, to stand on the side of, of Palestinian freedom and liberation. So I think that, pa I mean, from my, my experience shows that Palestinians are very kind of um, forgiving and just want to be able to live this uh, a free and dignified life and not forget where Palestinians won't forget. And I don't, don't think you can forget the pain um, that Palestinians have lived and losing a child, losing a limb, all of these things, but willing to forgive in order to move forward. I think that Palestinians um, have that capacity and way more than I understand to tell you the truth. And I don't have time to tell you those stories, but there will need to, as someone else asked, be a truth and reconciliation committee and other kind of post conflict, I hate using that word, but uh, programs in order to come to terms with what happens and recognize, you know, uh, a part of that is recognizing what happens. Sometimes Palestinians, our truth, our history is, is erased all of the time, not to mention our existence as a people, uh, there are attempts to erase it. And these kinds of programs to acknowledge the pain and the history and the loss and what happened uh, in the form of truth and reconciliation committees and other commissions and other programs will have to take place. And um, although I don't wanna end on this note, I know I've been criticizing the, the PLO and the Palestinian Authority a lot. This is not to say that the situation that they're in is easy. It, it, it is outside pressure that convinced the PLO to adopt this two-state solution, right? And, and to move towards that. And now you have a state where Palestinians have kind of started building the state and there are all of these people, uh, hundreds of thousands of people that depend on the pa Palestinian Authority for their livelihood. And the Palestinian Authority is completely dependent on foreign aid uh, because Israel controls everything. And therefore, like we see, if the USA it cuts off money. If the Europeans cut off money, the Arab countries that are normalizing are also, these are all putting pressures on the Palestinian Authority to kind of stay with this line of negotiations and a two-state solution. And once that, that, that it's not an excuse, but I'm telling you, they've kind of corralled themselves into this narrow thinking and into this situation where they've lost the trust of Palestinians internationally and the coffers that the PLO used to depend on, now reliant on kind of state aid and states that are pushing them to, to continue down this disastrous road. And I don't think that they see a way out. I think if they would agree 
to start a process of rebuilding, the first step must be to regain the trust of your people, because then I think the people can lead you forward. And then the PLO can lead a global campaign, which I think will garner the support that they're afraid that they're going to lose from the people that are um, supporting them now. So again, so much more to say in such a small time. I don't want to hog the end of this, um, but thank you everybody for, for joining in. Uh, those will be my last comments for now. And I really respect all the work that everyone is doing. And I think together we do have a, a positive uh, outlook. Thank you. Thank you, Huwait. And I, I just want to want to uh, emphasize uh, what you said about Palestinians wanting to, to uh, share and, and, and live uh, with Jews. Because when I was there in 2017, and spent weeks going all over the West Bank and East Jerusalem. That was the uniform reaction reception that I found. It was quite heartening and actually quite extraordinary. Um, does, uh, I know we're, we're a little over time. Uh, does anybody want to, want to uh, uh, make some final remarks? Beth should certainly get a chance to say something else. Yeah. Um, yeah, this has been a real honor to be part of this conversation. I would love to just add that I, um, I, I really strongly agree with the, with the framing of this being an anti-colonial anti struggle. And I, do, I just want to make very clear that I believe that that is core to this liberation movement. And I think that um, it feels actually like a common thread from all of us that that, that is a framing, that that is, that is that's not the framing, that's the reality of the situation. And so I think that um, the thing that I'm gonna be thinking about as I step away from this panel moving forward, I think really is about this idea of what are each of our roles in this movement that we're all in together, which is some whether we're allies in solidarity with Palestinians or Palestinians leading the struggle, I think um, we all have a different role that we're playing and there's a diversity of tactics that can make this movement richer and stronger as we as grassroots activists and individuals work to force states and governments to be what they need to be and to um, work for our collect collective liberation together. I think that it's actually kind of, it leaves me feeling very hopeful that there's so many different ways that we're all um, working together on that and approaching this issue. So I'll leave it there. Um, just really appreciative of this whole conversation. Okay, I want to I want to thank all of you. Uh, it's been an honor for me to participate uh, in this panel. I want to thank all of the uh, people who tuned in or listened in. I want to apologize to them for not getting to more of their questions, <clears throat> but I think the, the the conversation was was great and quite enlightening on on many fronts. And I look forward to, uh, to another opportunity to, to do that. So um, good night to everybody. Uh, stay safe, stay, health, uh, stay healthy, and peace, peace to all of us. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.